So I'm now honored to introduce our esteemed members of Congress who are here with us today. And I want to remind our elected officials that if there's any filibustering, a giant metal claw is going to come out of the wall and remove you, OK? I'm just kidding. You can talk for as long as you want. So for our first speaker today is Representative Beto O'Rourke from Texas's 16th district. And we're so looking forward to what you have to say, sir. So please take the stage. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here, uh, David and, and Bob, and uh, for everyone in the room who works so hard to improve the outcomes for our veterans. I want to thank you uh, personally for what you do. And it is only through this job, I'm, I'm starting my fourth year, that I've uh, begun to understand how important your work is. And so I just want you to know from the outset how grateful uh, I am for it. Um, I want to tell you uh, a little bit about my involvement um, with this issue. Uh, I ran for office in 2012, and veterans' issues were, frankly, not a priority of mine. Uh, weren't on my radar, wasn't something that I was paying attention to. But we were running an insurgent campaign, which required me to knock on a number of doors, about 16,000 doors uh, over the course of that cycle. And Door after door, I was meeting veterans or their family members, and I was hearing some truly incredible, unbelievable stories about how hard it was for them to get into the VA. And most alarmingly, I was hearing from veterans who could not get in for needed mental health care. And I remember very clearly in January of 2012, knocking on a door, a uh, gentleman answered the door. I made my pitch, and I asked him, now, what is it that you'd like me to work on should I be elected? How can I best represent you? And he said, well, I'll tell you something. I just got off the phone with the VA. And mind you, this is January. And he said, I told them I needed a mental health appointment. And they told me to call back next year because all the mental health appointments were booked for 2012. Now, I thought he was exaggerating to make a point. But a similar story followed uh, wherever I went in the community, west side, east side, lower valley, Northeast, I was hearing from veterans with very similar experiences. And after being elected, I was holding town halls every month. And dominating those town halls were veterans and their stories about their inability to access mental health care in the community. Waiting not weeks, not months, uh, but in some cases years, or just not being able to get in at all. And um, the urgency, uh, to echo Dr. Shulkin's uh, very important word, was brought home to me when I met the mother of a veteran who came to my office and said, my son was at your last town hall meeting. And he heard all of these older Vietnam era veterans coming to the microphone talking about how they couldn't get in uh, to receive the mental health care that they needed and that they'd obviously earned and deserved. And he said, mom, if these guys, and he was a younger veteran, if these guys uh, who've been trying for so long who served 40 years ago can't get in, what are my chances? And shortly thereafter, he took his own life. And uh, that story made the necessary connection for me, that care delayed is often care denied. And from that, we see incredibly tragic consequences. At a minimum, the suffering unnecessarily of those veterans whose care has been denied or delayed. And at the worst, uh, we see these outcomes where veterans take their own lives. Um, so that made this issue our primary focus in our office. And while we could call attention to the issue and soon learn that El Paso's wait times were in fact the worst in the country, uh, out of 148 uh, some odd uh, VHA mental health care uh, access points, we were 148th uh, in the nation. Um, so what to do about that? Certainly I made Secretary Shinseki and then Acting Secretary Gibson and then Secretary McDonald, aware of the issue, uh, demanded and requested resources, which they did, to their credit, surge to El Paso. Uh, but that didn't seem to do the trick. And then I was very fortunate to uh, be in a hearing uh, on the VA committee where I heard from Howard and Jean Summers, uh, who are here today, who talked about very courageously uh, the trials of their son in his attempts to get care uh, for uh, the, the care that he had earned 
uh, and that he deserved, that he was unable to adequately and effectively get. And they presented an idea that made so much common sense to me and yet was so bold and audacious and utterly transformational relative to how the VA was, um, was doing business that it caught my attention and I was able to follow up with them and begin to use that idea as the kernel for what we hoped was going to be the transformation that we were going to see in El Paso. And that idea was this, that if, as Dr. Shulkin says, we are really in a crisis of veteran suicides and mental health care access, and if we want to meet that with the urgency that a crisis would really require, then we have to make some difficult choices. We have to prioritize some things over some other things within the VA. And the Summers idea was, why not have the VA do a few things really, really well in-house, those few things all being connected to service and combat. So post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, military sexual trauma, traumatic amputations, those things that only those who've served in combat or worn the uniform, by and large, will experience as apart from the civilian population. And then those other things, to mention podiatry, uh, or diabetes, or getting your teeth fixed, those other things that are comparable to what the civilian population is routinely treated for, let's ensure that veterans who need that kind of care can see a doctor in the community, because that capacity and that caregiving exists, and it can be taken care of in the community so that the VA can prioritize on the urgent matter at hand, which is mental health care access and preventing more veteran suicides. So with that transformational idea, uh, I went back to my community and I talked to the private caregivers, the public and private hospitals, talked to the VA director, talked to the veteran service organizations and the veterans themselves. And together over the course of the year, we came up with a plan to essentially prioritize within the VA those conditions that are unique to service, to prior, prioritize for referral to the community those conditions that are comparable to the civilian population, and very importantly for this idea to succeed, to elevate and in the first place create um, the competence within the VA to coordinate that care regardless of where it is delivered, whether that those people are care coordinators or navigators or whatever we choose to call them, they will ensure that it is up to the VA as the hub for the care that is delivered to make the appointments, to follow up, to ensure that we get the outcomes, including veterans being seen uh, by mental health care professionals uh, that they need for this to be successful. I am very heartened to see that in the proposal that Secretaries McDonald and Shulkin made uh, at the end of last year to transform the VA, the VA nationally is pursuing a very similar course making full use of capacity within our communities for conditions that are comparable to civilian uh, conditions, and then for those conditions that are unique to service, making sure that the VA is a center of excellence and escalating and elevating the need to get mental health care professionals and those unique spe specialists who can treat traumatic brain injury, PTSD, and those other conditions that are connected to service. We as a community, we're able to adopt that plan. We were able to bring in partners like Texas Tech, which has just brought to the VA five psychiatrists who were not in the system before, who are now able to see patients in El Paso. Uh, thanks to the Clay Hunt Act and the new residencies created, there are eight new residencies in El Paso, three of those being psychiatrists, which over the long term is going to increase capacity within the VA to ensure that those who need mental health care are able to receive it. Um, and by and large, we're moving in the right direction. We're making progress, with one exception. Uh, while these partnerships have been great, uh, while we are seeing capacity in the civilian community for those conditions that are comparable to those seen in the civilian population, we are struggling to recruit the right mental health specialist to El Paso. So these residencies are great. Uh, the partnership with Texas Tech is wonderful. Uh, but we are at the same mental health staffing level that we were in September of 2014. So my appeal to you is that if you or your colleagues or someone you know in the mental health care field wants to be at the forefront of the transformation 
of VA mental health care access, you need to come to El Paso, Texas. <laughs> it, it may sound funny on its face, but uh, I, I promise you uh, that this community, more than any other, would value your service and benefit from it. This community, more than any other, is dedicated to leading the VA out of the mental health care access crisis that it is still in today. And you or your colleagues or that special someone that you know uh, can be in, at the ground floor of the transformation taking place in El Paso that will extend throughout this country. So if you're interested, let me give you my cell phone number. Um, it's 915-227-2732, 915-227-2732. I will personally talk to any psychiatrist, psychologist, mental health specialist who is interested in taking a chance on El Paso, coming to our community, and being part of the leadership that will transform the VA. So for all of you who are part of what is so important to caring for our veterans, I want to thank you for the courageous family members, really, uh, whose advocacy uh, was the catalyst for this transformation. I want to thank you as well. And to the leadership of the VA uh, leading this charge, thank you for taking the risks, being so bold, and doing so much for our veterans. Thank you all. Well, I got your phone number and you got my vote, sir. So how about that? Um, any interest in running this year for president? We could fast track you really quickly, okay? It's a kind of an open field, I think, as I see it. All right, just I'll give you my number later. All right, next up, we have Senator Tom Tillis from North Carolina, one of my favorite states. Oh, I forgot to say, I've been to El Paso. I'm sorry, sir, I love North Carolina. I'm gonna retire there. But I had the best time in El Paso, and I got the best boots. So do not underestimate El Paso, people. It is really kind of a cool place. So I'm just saying that right now. Sir, I'm sorry. I'm going to um, retire in Asheville with Bob, just so you know. So just keep it clean and nice and fun the way it's been. And we are going to welcome Senator Tom Tillis, who is also a member of the House Veteran Affairs Committee. Thank you so much. Congressman, that was a great job. Uh, I was going to make a similar appeal to Fayetteville, uh, Cherry Point, uh, Jacksonville, uh, Elizabeth City. I also want to say you're, you're entering your fourth year in Congress. You look like you're entering your fourth year in college. So uh, thank you for your great work and uh, great words. I won't repeat, but will associate myself with the uh, comments of the congressman. <clears throat> I want to thank you all for being here. And I'm very new to this Senate. I'm a year into it. Uh, when I was asked what committees I wanted to be on, I said only two. Normally, you'll ask for three, four, or five. I said, I want to get the first two down. Otherwise, the other ones don't matter. And they were Senate Armed Services and Veterans. And I have to tell you, it's been fantastic. The Veterans Committee I like for a variety of reasons, one of which you really have to work hard to take a partisan position. You really would. So we tend to work together. I've worked already with Senator, Senators Blumenthal and uh, Senators Brown on meaningful bills and, and continue to want, want to continue to work on that. Uh, the other reason that I like the Veterans Committee is the rubber really hit, meets the road. I mean, if you spend time back in your states, you have an opportunity to meet incredible people, veteran service organizations, other groups that are really working together to try and solve this problem. You also get the opportunity, and, and by the way, someone that I should recognize, should have recognized to begin with, is uh, Senator Dole, Senator Elizabeth Dole, and Senator Bob Dole. I want to thank them for all that they do for veterans. Thank you so much. But I also, also want to thank uh, Dr. Shulk and, and Secretary McDonald. We've developed, I think, a great relationship over the last year. I'm completely convinced that we have leadership that's committed to transformation. And I'm committed to doing everything that I can to help them with that transformation. To not treat a Veterans Affairs Committee like a clearinghouse for constituent request, but to treat it like it should be, an opportunity to talk about the structural things that have to change, so that we can get to an improved level of care for our veterans. That's what it's all about. Now, make no mistake about it, I can be a real pain when I've got somebody in my state. I've got a million veterans in my state, one-tenth of my population. I will clear that constituent request, but what I want to do, and I thought that the transformation meeting a week or so ago was a great 
example of when we can elevate the discussion to a point to where we can get to the systemic problems in the VA that are preventing the outcomes from occurring. I have no doubt in my mind that the leadership wants to transform the VA. I have no doubt in my mind that the people in the VA facilities want to transform the VA. So then you've got to start looking at the kinds of things that may be going on that are preventing these objectives from being achieved at the pace that we'd like to have them achieved. And I think a lot of it comes from what we as members of Congress have to recognize. The layers and layers of mandates and dictates and things that have come over time that this leadership and this VA has to navigate through. A part of the solution to the VA problem is recognizing that many of the things that we've required in the past, although they may have made sense at some point in time, they no longer make sense. They need to be a part of changing the VA. And if we look at it that way, we provide the flexibility, we ensure the accountability, but provide the flexibility, I'm convinced that we can do great things. And when it comes to suicide prevention, it's one of the most important things we have to focus on. I actually feel blessed that about eight years ago, I went through a, a difficult time. I <clears throat> had uh, treatment that for a brief period of time caused me to have pharmacologically induced mania. And then shortly after that, a, a, a bout of depression for about six months, or about six weeks, I should say. It gave me a profound appreciation for what someone may be going through who have a mental health condition. It also gave me a profound appreciation for what a loving wife has to go through in providing care. So something else that I think we need to focus on are how do we better support the families, the spouses and the children who are also a part of the, the, the most important part of the provider network that these men and women who are suffering depression and maybe be, may be at risk of suicide. We've got to do a better job. Sunday morning I met with a very prominent person in the uh, Boys and Girls Club to talk about what more we can do to support veterans. We don't do a lot in, in the way of supporting the veterans, giving you that armor you need. And I would also argue that my kids who went through this needed a little bit of armor themselves. So as we move forward, I want to do everything that I can to broaden the base of the support that we give, but also make sure that our members of Congress recognize that we need to be a part of the solution. And in order for us to be a part of the solution, we have to recognize that we've been a part of the problem. And then by doing that, we will improve care, we will do great things, and hopefully we can get away from this tragedy of some 22 veterans a day committing suicide. It's a tragedy, it's a crisis, and it's something that I'm committing to help end. Thank you all. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Senator. So next, from South Dakota, if anyone's been to the Badlands, that's a pretty cool place to be, Senator Michael Rounds, who is also a member of the Senate Veteran Affairs Committee. Senator Rounds. Thank you and good morning. It, uh, it's very special to be here with all of you today. Um, I want to thank Secretary McDonald for his invitation to discuss this very important issue. Uh, I also want to thank Dr. Bassart and Dr. Thompson for detailing the scope of the issue and for voicing this call to action. As a member of the uh, Senate Veterans Affairs Committee and a senator from a state that has more than 72,000 veterans, we've got a little less than 800,000 people in our state, so we're closing in on that 10% number as well. Um, these folks have served very honorably. I take great interest in getting our veterans the quality care that they truly deserve, and that means on a timely basis. And you've heard the discussions so far this morning about that. While most of the recent available numbers on veteran suicide have shown improvement in recent years, even one veteran taking their life uh, due to the mental or physical stresses caused by service to this nation is one too many. While the VA has created multiple programs and policies since 2007 to reduce veteran suicide, much more needs to be done to take care of our heroes once they return from the battlefield. According to VA stats, between 10 and 20% of veterans returning from operations Iraqi and enduring freedom are diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and more than 150,000 veterans have been diagnosed with PTSD in the last 15 years. While physical injuries can, see, can be seen and treated, many of our veterans continue to suffer in silence. Last year, the Clay Hunt Suicide Prevention for American Veterans Act was one of the first pieces of legislation that I signed on to as a 
newly elected senator. It easily passed the Senate and was signed into law on February 12th of 2015. As divided as Washington, D.C. can be, and as often it appears to be that way all the time, it is a relief when all of the parties are able to come together in a bipartisan effort to support our nation's veterans. This was one of those times. While this particular law will help to eliminate programs that aren't working to help solve the issue and focus on the ones that are, Congress and the VA can still do more. Currently, no nationwide surveillance system exists for suicide among all veterans. With the majority of veterans not enrolled, and I say not enrolled in the Veterans Health Administration, accurate data is hard to come by. Per the Department of Health and Human Services, surveillance is the first step in solving the problem of suicide at large. Accurate surveillance is then followed by identifying risk and protective factors, which is followed by intervention strategies. We can't accurately identify risk factors and evaluate our intervention strategies without effective surveillance. While the VA has done a good job gleaning data from the National Death Index and developing data sharing agreements with all 50 states, surveillance still needs to be a top priority. Easy access to care is clearly another area where we can continue to improve as it is one of the most important protective factors against suicide. Making the 2014 Veterans Access, Choice, and Accountability Act work effectively for our veterans needs to remain a top priority of the VA and the Veterans Affairs Committees. I fully support the veterans' goals of drastically reducing appointment wait time, streamlining provider claims reimbursements, and building the very best network of care with the veteran at the center. While the Choice Act has good intent, its implementation has had its difficulties, and we need to continue to refine and simplify the process. Too many veterans in South Dakota and across the country are having trouble getting care in the private sector, and too many providers are not being reimbursed in a timely fashion. In South Dakota, these problems are exacerbated by the geographic challenges stemming from our state's rural character. We're 200 miles north to south, and we're 400 miles east to west. No less than 60% of my office's casework stems from veterans who are requesting help. When I was governor, I served as governor for, for two terms, a total of eight years. Uh, it was during the time in which we were ramping up. Um, and I remember the National Guard men and women who were leaving and one in particular I'll never forget. It was um, uh, the 147th Field Artillery, Battery B. It was in the town of, of uh, Redfield. Small town, but the 147th had members from all of the surrounding communities as well. And I remember it because as we drove up to the front of the school, because the going away ceremony was gonna be in that school gymnasium. And as we drove up, you couldn't find a place to park because the community had turned out. We walked inside and there was not a place to sit in the gym. The windowsills had people sitting on them. We walked on in and we said thank you to these young men, and at that time it was all men in this unit, who were gonna go off to war, and at that time we didn't know whether or not they were gonna come back or not. I remember as we sat down afterwards and we walked through the line with these men and there were about 120 of them that were leaving that day from this particular community and the communities around it. I walked up and I saw a guy with gray hair, one of the old guys in the thing, shook his hand. I said, bring them back, bring them back safe. Get the job done, but bring them back. And he said, yes, sir. Next guy in line, young guy, looked just like the other guy but without the gray hair, same last name. I said, is that your dad ahead of you? He says, no, sir. That's my uncle. My dad's behind me. You see, in every small community, as a matter of fact, throughout America, in any community, you find entire families that are touched anytime one of our veterans is not taken care of properly. This is not just an issue 
that affects the men and women that wear the uniform or that have worn the uniform. This affects all of our communities in a very special way, and we should never forget it. Because what we do to take care of these young men and women, that impacts, that impacts the well-being of each and every one of our communities in the United States. And so if we take care of just one more, that's one more community that's better off. That's one more community that feels good about the way that we've treated those men and women that have fought and died for us. We cannot and we will not stop working to address the issue of veteran suicide until every single veteran is adequately cared for. Thank you. About a year after Bob was injured, uh, we wrote a book and we went out on tour and I was in Rochester, New York, probably near where you were, uh, and a young couple, youngish couple, I'm old now so they looked young, were sort of off to the side waiting for the book line to go through and after everybody had signed books, they came up to me with, and Bob, with a picture of their son and they told me his story and he had signed up after September 11th to go overseas. He was so excited to serve his country. And when he got to Iraq in a new, very green unit, on their first sort of sortie, their first mission out on foot, they saw father and son coming toward them. And the commander gave the order to shoot. He said, shoot them, they're wired, shoot them. And the mother told me that her son in his head thought, wait a minute, that boy is about the same age as my little brother. What about the Ten Commandments? I can't kill a child. And that thought went through his head, and no one was shooting, because they were all young and new soldiers, until the commander continued to repeat that phrase, and somebody shot. And in fact, the little boy and his father were wired. And as the body parts of that father and son hit the helmets of all those men, something inside of this young man broke. And when he came home from his first deployment, his mother said he just sat on the couch. He just changed channels and wouldn't get up. He'd promised our son that he would teach him how to hunt when he came home, but he just didn't have it in him. And when he was deployed for a second time, he stepped on a landmine and he died. And his mother said to me, I think that he's in a better place right now than he would have been if he'd come home because he's with the Lord. That was nine years ago. And in those nine years, we've made so much progress. And as was said today, we have the tools to fix this. We know how to take a broken brain. We know how to take PTS. We know how to deal with depression. And we know how to stop the ideation of suicidal thoughts. So that's what today is about. And it's so heartening to hear you all talking about solutions, not just laying the problems out again and again so we can kick the can down the road, but to really talk about how we can all come together on this. I know our next speaker personally, uh, Senator Blumenthal's wife, Cynthia, sits on our board at the Bob Woodruff Foundation. And while I sort of almost live in Connecticut, Westchester County, I feel like he's my senator. And I can tell you, being right next door, he is held in such high regard for so many things that he does, not, not the least of which is having three or two, I, already, I always get this wrong, children who serve, two out of four, 50%. That's an incredible thing to have someone serving in Congress for us who understands what it means to send a child to war. So as a ranking member of the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee, please welcome Senator Richard Blumenthal. Thank you so much. Uh, I am really proud and excited to be here today uh, for this really important, momentous, and truly historic call to action which is exactly what this problem demands. Uh, one of the credentials that uh, was not mentioned is that my wife serves on the board of the Woodruff Foundation. And I can tell you, this organization is literally changing the face of our approach to suicide, traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress, 
It is doing absolutely magnificent work, and I have such respect for the Woodruffs uh, and the great work that they are doing. I can tell you one of the proudest moments of my serving in the United States Senate was to go to the White House for the signing of the Clay Hunt Veteran Suicide Prevention Bill. Bipartisan measure that I advocated. I was the chief sponsor along with John McCain. Uh, John McCain and I went to the White House that day and we stood next to the President as he signed that bill. A bill to provide more outreach, more resources by enhancing reimbursement for loans to psychiatrists and attracting them to the VA, more support for families, and more research, because research is so important when it comes to post-traumatic stress, and the Woodruff Foundation is sponsoring a lot of the best research in the country. And as we stood there, Senator McCain and I, next to the President, also with us was Clay Hunt's mom. And I think the family may be with us today. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. And thanks for your incredible advocacy. Uh, it was a powerful moment because of who stood next to us, but also because of the audience. In that audience were families who have lost loved ones to suicide, including Joanna Eldridge, the widow of a friend of mine, Justin Eldridge, who, like Clay Hunt, served in Afghanistan or Iraq and came back with those invisible wounds of war and took his own life, leaving Joanna and five children. It was a powerful moment for me because it emphasized that we can get things done. We can successfully act on this problem. Despite all of the frustration and the dysfunction that the public finds so antithetical, we can do things about veterans. We can make their lives better. We can provide them with better jobs and skill training and housing and, yes, health care, mental health care. And the Clay Hunt measure is just a beginning. I refer to it as a down payment because what's needed is a major effort in this area, increasing the numbers of professionals who are available, and that number has increased since 2010 from about 11,000 to 14,000, a commendable increase, but even more access has to be provided. And the point that I want to make to you here is that the public is ready for it. Our colleagues are ready for it. As I go around to my constituents and elsewhere around the country and I say to them, you know, the numbers show that 22 veterans every day commit suicide. I talk about post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury, the invisible wounds of war, about the need for more investment in our VA. The response is overwhelming. This is not a door that's locked. It's an open door for us, politically. We should take advantage of it. We should seize this moment. Out of this conference, I hope, will come a determination to reach out beyond Washington, D.C., to reach even beyond the Congress, to mobilize the public and to educate them about the consequences and the magnitude of this problem. I want to thank the VA's present leadership for focusing on this issue. This conference is just one example. And I know that Secretary McDonald and Dr. Shulkin are really committed. So I hope that you will help us mobilize our colleagues in the Congress. My chairman, Johnny Isaacson, is going to be speaking shortly. And he has done an excellent job on the committee in educating our colleagues and bringing us together, again, on a completely bipartisan basis. 
but it is an opportunity that we cannot lose. I've introduced a measure to provide more peer support, peer to peer, veteran to veteran, to bring veterans into the services that are available. More psychiatrists and professionals are necessary, and I know that Secretary McDonald is actively trying to recruit, increasing the loan reimbursement program to make a beginning career at the VA more attractive to veterans. There are a, a range of measures that we can use, those and many, many others, but we have this opportunity now. And especially as we go into this last part of the session, I think we can't afford to lose it. It's an opportunity that we have an obligation to use and put to use. And I want to thank all of you who are here today for your commitment to this cause. It is preeminently one of the public health challenges of our nation today, veterans' suicide. We have an obligation to all who are serving now, all who have served. Uh, I have two sons who have served. One is serving now as a Navy officer. Uh, the other was in the Marine Corps Reserve and went to Afghanistan and is back very safely, fortunately. But I see through the eyes of the post-9-11 veterans as well as those who served when post-traumatic stress was not even diagnosed, battle fatigue, shell shock. This problem is not going away on its own. And I want to thank you for being here today and for sharing the sense of urgency that all of us must feel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. And I assure you that I did not pay him to say that about the foundation. Or maybe we can talk later. But I am seeing some of my colleagues here uh, in the room, uh, TAPS and Given Hour. And I just want to say that for all of you out there, this is a collaborative effort. And we would not be where we're going to be and where we are um, without all of these incredible nonprofits working together. So with that, I am uh, honored also to introduce Senator Johnny Isaacson from uh, Georgia, and as Senator uh, Blumenthal said, he's the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee Chairman. So we're honored to have you speak, sir. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'm delighted to be here today, particularly in the presence of the parents of Daniel Summers, Dr. and Ms. Summers, and Mr. and Ms. Sulky, the parents of Clay Hunt. You both are an inspiration to us, your families. We appreciate the sacrifice you have made to illuminate the focus we need to have in the United States Senate and the United States House. Out of tragedy, good things can happen, and hopefully that's exactly what will happen out of the tragedies that are taking place in our veterans, as well as the, the success that we have by this seminar today. I'm not going to talk for a long time at all because you probably will have heard everything I'm going to say except one thing. My life was touched by suicide in 1957 when I was a teenager. So I, I talk about the subject not as someone who's read about it or knew about somebody who happened to have it have hit their family, it hit my family. I know the tragedy of suicide and what it can mean to a family and the many mystical things that are out there where people wonder what happened. Why couldn't I have prevented it? Why didn't I see it coming sooner? Why didn't we know? I think the focus of the Clay Hunt Bill, which we passed as the first act of the, this Congress out of the VA committee, was the first targeted focus on, for us to really look to answer those questions about why we didn't know and find out ways we could find out. Take away the stigma to not talk about suicide and instead talk about it. For me in the VA, it happened very simply in August of, 19, of 2013. We had three suicides inside of eight days at the VA hospital in Atlanta. One of them took place in the hospital. Two of them were patients being served in the hospital. It made news all over Atlanta, and as chairman of the Veterans Committee, or no, I wasn't chairman, then I was a member of the committee, the, immediate, the press immediately came to me and said, why is this happening? So we began to look, and we had the first field hearing in 2013 in Atlanta. We brought in all the experts. We brought in the Veterans Administration. We brought in everybody, and we found out we were short. 
in terms of the number of people we needed, the number of contractors we needed, the number of physicians we needed, to have a timely evaluation to bridge that dangerous period of time when somebody's at risk for their life by taking suicide. And we have begun since 2013 to make progress towards eliminating the, the time it's taken to have services available to our veterans, increase the access through our hotlines, and provide a greater number of contractors and programs in the communities to see to it we have a continuity of care for our veterans. It's by no means perfect, but Dr. Bob McDonald has done a great job as the Secretary. I appreciate particularly Dr. Shulkin and all that he has done to focus on this issue. Because for all of us, we need to make sure that if someone is at risk for their life, there's not a stigma to call us. In fact, there's a warning. They know we want them to hear from them. We know that our, our active duty personnel, when they evaluate soldiers, when they leave the battlefield, look for those telltale signs that we need to look for. And then when they get, go from DOD health care to veterans health care, they don't go into a black hole of a lack of attention, but instead get the focus they should get as a veteran to see to it. If they have a problem, it is our problem. It is not just their problem. And as long as I stay on as chairman of the Veterans Committee, I'm going to work to do everything I can to give the VA the support and the attention it needs to see to it. Every American veteran has timely evaluation, timely coordinated care, and we begin to reduce the rate of suicide in America of our veterans and improve the quality of health care to all of them. God bless all of you for being here today. Thank you for your support of this effort. And if there's ever anything we can do for you, just give us a call. We'll be glad to help. Thank you. I was going to share something, Caitlin, that came off something you said that struck me. How little we think about caring for the caregiver in the military setting and how many military nurses and medics I have met who said to me, I couldn't save that young man on the battlefield. And their own sense of trauma over all of the lives that were lost, as one woman said to me, through my hands. And I remember when Bob first returned back to Walter Reed when he was making a documentary about not just his journey, but four other veterans with traumatic brain injury. And to come back to that ward, to that traumatic brain injury ward, and be able to hug and kiss, but more importantly, let the nurses and docs hug and kiss him, for them to see that not only had he lived, but he had thrived, was a kind of healing and a kind of therapy, I imagine, that uh, there were no words for. And it made me realize how few times so many of our military uh, medics and healthcare workers in the VA system get to see the end result, get to see the person healed, and how that trauma compounds trauma, and how we must include them in the equation of thinking about suicide prevention. We have our last uh, speaker, Representative Corinne Brown, who is a ranking member of the House Veteran Affairs Committee, so from Florida's 5th District. Um, we welcome you to the stage. Good morning, and God has blessed America by you being in this room and give the families a hand. Thank you so much. Thank you. You know, when you're born, you get a birth certificate, and when you die, you're going to get a death certificate, and that dash in between is what you've done to make this a better place. I want to thank everybody in this room that have worked to help stop veteran suicide. Give yourself a hand. And I very much appreciate the words that we've gotten from the family. But what is most also disturbing is the amount of elderly veterans that are committing suicide. Those who have come back and have worked and going into their second career. So it, it's a multiplicity of things that we have to do in this area. Now, I'm going to share my time with one of our stakeholders, Martin Luther King III. We just finished sharing uh, the birthday of Martin Luther King, and part of what we have to do is to educate the community of the problems and how we can engage our stakeholders in helping to get the word out. And so I want to share my time with my friend, Martin Luther King III. Come on up. Give him a hand. Thank, thank you, Congresswoman. I, um, 
just happened to be with the Congresswoman this morning when she said that she was going to be at this most important event. And just hearing from the families uh, should inspire all of us that the fact that it has had to become an epidemic for our society to address it is so tragic for the women and men who per, uh, are sworn to protect and serve our nation every day. And while it is a very sad scenario, there is nothing in this nation that we cannot resolve. When families, women and men have, and have come together, we've seen great change and progress in this country. And so I am certain that as it relates to mental health issues, they can be addressed. It's tragic that it had to get to this. We have one of the greatest militaries, if not the greatest, in the world. And for our women and men to go and give their lives protecting and serving and then come home because of PTS and other things, committing suicide should not be the case at the levels that they exist today. Uh, I just recently realized, I've seen articles over and over about the number of, of, of men and women that are committing suicide, but I didn't realize that it was so, that we are the, I think we lead the world. And something has to be done and something has to be done now. Uh, the families gave very practical solutions that can be instituted tomorrow. All I know, uh, coming out of the family of one of the most uh, preeminent civil and human rights leaders and one who advocated nonviolence, is that it only took a few good women and men to bring about change. And so my dad and his team were able to accomplish great things in our nation that reverberated throughout our world. So I know that a few good women and men, uh, it doesn't take but a few good women and men to address this issue as it relates to veterans committing suicide. That is unacceptable. When we say that, when we institute and implement these plans, that begins to at least be reduced. And maybe one day it can totally be eliminated. That's the kind of society we live in. Thank you for all that you each are doing. And I thank you just for allowing me uh, to be here with the Congresswoman just to share a very small perspective. And I will use my voice. I speak every day almost around the nation and sometimes throughout the world. I'm going to certainly use my voice to continue to raise this issue because it is unacceptable. We can and we must and we will do better. Thank you and God bless you and God bless America.